Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, if you will take them out and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. This morning we're going to take some time and we're going to look at the importance of Easter. What makes this holiday different than all the others? Why is this Easter celebration so important to your faith as a believer in Jesus Christ? You know, when we begin to look at the importance of Easter, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is it? that makes Christ's death on the cross different than other religious leaders who have died for a good cause. There is a tremendous difference, I would submit to you in the beginning this morning, there's a tremendous difference between Jesus Christ and the rest of the founders of world religions today. They have lived and they have died And the truth is today you can go and you can visit the place where they're buried, their tomb, uh, the graveside. But Jesus Christ has well lived. Jesus Christ died. But the difference is Jesus Christ on the third day rose again. Buddha is still dead. Confucius is dead. But Jesus Christ is alive. Muhammad is dead. But Jesus Christ, you can go visit where Jesus was buried, but the tomb is empty. He's not there. You see, the angel said to him when they went looking in the tomb, they said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen. Friend, when you go to Jesus' tomb, it's just a residual of what used to be. It's proof that he paid the price. But the real proof is in the fact he's not in the tomb, but he is alive. A Buddhist in Africa was converted from Buddhism to Christianity. And when asked, why did you convert to Christianity, he said, it's like this. If you're walking along a path and you come to a fork in that path and two men are standing there, one is dead, the other one is alive, which man's directions would you want to follow? The resurrection, my friend, is essential to everything that we believe as Christians. The resurrection is pivotal to the gospel message, and it is absolutely essential to your salvation and the forgiveness of your sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where we're at this morning. If you will look there with me, beginning in verse number 12. But if it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then to be found false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. My friend, I would submit to you today that Jesus Christ's death and resurrection are essential to the Christian faith. The resurrection has incredible value and significance in your life today, but it has incredible significance in your life for the future. 
It's important that we understand how Christ's life, his death, and his resurrection applies to us in 2017. Because we know over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ lived, died, rose again, and it was relevant. But I would submit to you today, it is no less relevant today than it was 2,000 years ago. And this morning, I want to share with you for a few minutes on what the resurrection does for us. What uh, does it do for us and how does it apply to my faith in Jesus? The first thing I would submit to you today is this. The resurrection validates Christ's claims. The resurrection validates Christ's claims. Look in 1 Corinthians 15, look in uh, verse number 14. It says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. My friend, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all the claims that he made on this earth were not true. And what you and I believe today is false. Paul said our preaching of the gospel is useless and so is your faith in that gospel. The resurrection, my friend, is the one thing that validates all of Jesus Christ's claims. You see, throughout the timeline of humanity, mankind have made claims Joseph Stalin made claims that Christianity would cease to be. Voltaire, who was a staunch uh, man who stood in the face of the church and argued for its demise. Voltaire said that the Bible and believers in Jesus Christ would die out. But history has a way of telling a different story. History tells us that Joseph Stalin and Voltaire both died. History records for us, not only did they die, but they were buried, and today you can go to the place where they're buried. But while they're still in the grave, while death still has its hold on those two men, the gospel of Jesus Christ is still setting the captives free. It's still opening blind eyes. It's transforming lives. And my friend, in its timeline, the gospel has not slowed down in its momentum, but it's stronger than it's ever been. More people are coming to know Jesus Christ as Savior in 2017 than any time in history. The gospel is on the move. You see, claims and bold statements are only as good as the person's ability to back them up. Jesus Christ's resurrection validated and gave proof to every one of his claims. You see, Jesus was known as a man of authority. Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29 says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed. Has Jesus ever amazed you? The Bible says they were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Why is that important? Because, friend, when one has been granted authority, they also have power. We see it in Matthew 8 and verse 27 when Jesus stands up in the middle of the boat and calms the storm. The Bible says these men were amazed and they asked this question, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. For in Christ has authority over all the earth. Mark chapter 2 verses 9 through 12. It's the record of Jesus, Jesus healing the man who was paralyzed. Verse number 9 says, Which is easier to say the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up and take up your mat and walk? But I want you to know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. 
he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this before. The part I love about this story is that Jesus is there, and he's working these miracles. And he tells this brother, Your sins are forgiven. And the Bible says that the religious leaders began to think in their minds. They began to reason within them. So in other words, what it's saying, they're not outwardly arguing it, just inwardly. Have you ever met somebody and they're just kind of, something happens and they're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're reasoning on the inside. You've got words that are going on the inside. You're just not saying them outwardly. Well, the Bible says that's what these religious leaders were doing. They were sitting there reasoning. And not only did Jesus prove that he had power to forgive this man and to heal this man, but the part I love, he even knew what they were saying because he answered their thoughts. Friend, he has power over anything. Jesus Christ has authority over every physical impossibility, and he has authority over the sin in our lives. And friend, he knows everything that's going on in us. We see him throughout the scriptures, healing the sick, raising the dead, opening blind eyes, cleansing lepers, casting out demons. His very actions made claims about who he was. The disciples, they claimed that he was the son of God. Matthew 16 and 16, Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. John 1 and 49, then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. In John 11 and 27, Martha said, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who came into the world. Then Jesus answered the claims that they made in Luke 22 and 70. They all asked, are you the son of God? And he replied, you are right in saying that I am. He confirmed what all had been saying about him. When he told them in Matthew 28 and verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, friend, if you're going to make claims, you need to have the goods to back up the claim. Jesus not only made the claims, but he backed them up by the resurrection. It was the ultimate validation of his claims. For they had seen him on the cross. They saw him die. And then they saw him alive. You see, death had laid its hands on the Lord Jesus. And death had laid him in a tomb. He made the claim in John 2 and 19. He said, destroy this temple talking about his body destroy this temple and notice what he said I will raise it again I don't need anybody else to do it he said I have all authority I have all power I'm going to lay this body down and in three days I'm going to raise it again and on the third day friend life began to flicker life came into that tomb life came into that body who had been laying there by the others and life came in and Jesus Jesus Christ rose from the grave victorious and he overcame everything. Amen. Jesus left the grave clothes behind and passed through the walls of the tomb. I would remind you that the stone over the tomb was not rolled away in order to let Jesus Christ out. The stone was simply rolled away in order to let the disciples in so they might notice that he wasn't there any longer in the tomb. If there's only one message that I can give you today, I would state the simple fact, Jesus Christ is alive. He's not in a tomb. He's not a has-been. He's not a historical figure. He's not outdated. Friend, he's right on time. He's alive. He's well. He's interceding today for you and for me. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. I have one today who's pleading my case before the Heavenly Father. Oh, let me tell you today, I'm glad I don't have to believe in a has-been. 
I don't believe it's somebody who once said something, but he's saying things today. 2017, he's still at work in my life and in your life because he is alive. The resurrection validated Christ's claims. Friend, that's why Easter is so important. Not only did the resurrection validate his claims, but secondly, the resurrection confirms our salvation. It confirms our salvation. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Romans 3 and 23 for all, for all, somebody say all. all, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Friend, we've all broken the law and the command of the Lord. I've shared with you before how as a society and a culture we are atonement conscious. If there's a wrong that is done, a crime that is committed, we all within us have this voice that raises up and says somebody has to pay for what they've done. We've seen that this week on the news in regard to Syria and the atrocities that have recently happened. Somebody said, somebody's got to be stopped. They got to pay the price. Friend, we've all broken the law of God. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9 and 27 that just as people are destined to die once and after that we will face judgment. We're all going to stand before God one day to be judged. Judged on whether or not we have kept our lives to the glorious standard of God. Here's the problem. We've all sinned. I've sinned. You have sinned. And because of that, we are in trouble when that day comes. Why? Because we're all sinners. And we know we just the last two weeks we've been looking at the series on heaven. And we know that heaven is a place, the Bible says, it's a pure and holy city. It's a place no sin will be admitted into heaven. Well, friend, if no sin is admitted into heaven, then it's safe for us to make the assumption that no sinner will be admitted into heaven. And that is a problem for us. Since we are all sinners... Eternity is heaven or it's hell. Since we are sinners and we have made the assumption that no sin enters into heaven, we must assume that if we're not in heaven, then we're to place eternity called hell. How many of you know that's a bad place? That's a bad position for you and I to be in. You say, well, I'm a good person, friend. This room is filled with good persons. Can I tell you today that hell is probably filled with people who are good people? Amen. So we're in this dilemma. We're born sinners. Friend, it's not like you made the choice. I think today I'll become a sinner. We are born sinners. It's a part of our nature. It's who we are. We're not a sinner because we sin. We sin because we're a sinner at heart. So that leaves us in a very difficult place. Thank God for the grace and the mercy of God who was not willing to let you and I nor anybody in humanity be left in that place. God sent a remedy. The Bible tells us in Titus 3, 4, and 5, when the kindness, I love this passage, when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Can you say amen to that? Amen. He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He didn't save me because I made a good decision. He didn't save me because of anything I've ever done. He saved me because he is merciful. He saved us because he is kind and he's gracious. The message of the gospel is this. 
We're all guilty of sin. One day we will stand before a holy God to be judged for our sins, and someone must pay the price for our sin. The good news for you, the good news for me, the good news for everyone outside of this room today on the face of this planet, the good news is this, Jesus Christ came as the price for our sin. We are all guilty, but he came to take our guilt. He came to take away my debt. He came to take away everything that would send me to a place called hell, and he became my guilt for me. He became my sin for me, and he died on the cross, and he made you and I right with God. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. He became the offering. He became the payment for my sin. He was the price for my sin. God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for Jerry Galloway's sin so that Jerry could be made right with God. I'm not right with God because of anything I've done. I'm not right with God because of anything I've done or deserved or merited. I am only right with God because of Jesus Christ. I'm only right with God because he's merciful. I'm only right with God because his great grace and his great love reached down to where we were at. That's the only reason, my friend, that we are saved. Jesus Christ has already paid the sin debt. And now you and I, we can go free. We can go free. So why is Easter such a big deal? Friend, if Jesus Christ has not been raised to life, then your faith in the gospel is useless and you are still in your sin. If the resurrection never happened, you're still in trouble. I'm still in trouble. If he was just a good man, a prophet, a teacher, as many attest him to me, you and I are still in serious trouble. But aren't you glad that on the third day, he rose from the grave triumphant and so my faith is not futile and I'm not still in my sin though once I was in sin though once I was a sinner today I stand before you not as anybody other than a sinner that has been saved by the grace of God and the mercy of his name friend I tell you if he's not raised to life look at verse 18 it says in that case if he's not raised from the dead, all who have died, believe me in Christ, are lost. Wow. If that's the case, then John 14 where it says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there you be also. If he didn't rise from the grave, you might as well tear out the page that has John 14 on it. If Christ was not raised from the grave, you might as well tear out the page in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where it says the Lord himself shall come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Friends, if he's not risen from the grave, there is no comfort because there is no hope. If there is no hope, we might as well go home, take down our signs, and just quit this thing. He says, your faith, if there's no resurrection... Your faith is futile and you're still in your sin. The resurrection, it confirms our salvation. It seals the deal. 
The resurrection writes the words, paid in full over our sin. The death and the resurrection both come together. They pay the price. See, he didn't just say, it's paid. Friend, it's paid in full. He didn't just put $5 on your debt. He paid it in full. He didn't forgive you of some of your sin. He forgave you all your sin. 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. That's the hope of the gospel. Friend, that's why Easter is so important. If Jesus was still in the tomb, he wouldn't be any different than any other religious leader who died for a good cause. But Jesus is not in the tomb. He's not like any other religious leader. He is the son of the living God. So what does all this mean? How do we bring all this together? Friend, I would submit to you this morning a couple of thoughts in closing. Number one, the resurrection guarantees that our sin debt can be paid by Jesus Christ and we can be made right with God. You say, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. I may not, but he knows what you've done and he says you can be made right with God. Secondly, it guarantees that he has all power to forgive every sin and to give you and I a new start in this life. It also guarantees for us that there's nothing that Jesus Christ can't transform in your life. No power in your life he can't break. No sin too great he can't forgive. I'm telling you, I just about had myself a spell when we began to sing earlier and we said, Who can stop the Lord Almighty? What sin can stop him for forgiving? What power can stop him? What sickness can stop him? What situation can stop him? For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Number four, the resurrection does this. It says it's guaranteed. And it proves that Jesus Christ has power over everything on earth and in heaven and in your life. Now, the truth is, your life is probably like mine. Polly, you can come if you'd like. Your life is like mine. There are days sometimes that uh, I get some surprises. You ever get surprises in your life? I'm not talking about a birthday surprise. <laughs> I'm talking about those surprises that you get and you're like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? What's going to happen in my life? And Lord, how am I going to get through this thing? And how am I going to get across that mountain that just put itself in my way? How am I going to get through this valley that I'm facing? Lord, how am I going to get past that doctor's report that I just received? How, how am I, how am I ever going to make it through this? Maybe it's a relational hurt in your life and you think, how am I ever going to get over the brokenness in my heart? Maybe you have a situation in your life, friend, that is so, so large, you can't even begin to think how you're ever going to dig yourself out of this one. I want to remind you of something this morning. Jesus Christ has already overcome. He's already overcome. He's already overcome. So the work is already done because he's already overcome. He says, because I've overcome, you will overcome also. Hmm. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 28 and 18. He said, all authority has been given to me on the earth and in heaven. So that means everything has to bow its knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every situation, circumstance, need, physical problem, emotional problem, material problem, relational problem, everything has to bow its knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads?
Father, I pray in this moment, Lord, for men and women in this room. I pray for the hope of Jesus Christ to fill this room. I pray for the hope that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ to fill their hearts. Father, you know what this week and maybe this month and maybe even this year has been for some in this room. Father, I would say even what this past decade has been in some people's lives. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, no matter how long the journey's been, I pray that hope will fill their heart today. Hope in Jesus Christ. Hope that there is an answer. Hope that there's a way out of this thing. Hope that their better days are ahead of them. Hope that, God, you are in control of everything. Father, I pray it in the name of Jesus. I pray for those who've been wrestling with sin, a hidden sin possibly, Lord, and, and an area of habit. They wrestle, they've tried it. It seems like they just can't get away. The chain keeps pulling them back down. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray, Father, for deliverance, healing in their life. I pray for freedom once and for all in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for freedom and the hope of freedom to fill their heart that their best days are not behind them, but the best days are before them in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray these things in your name. I pray them knowing that you've already guaranteed it all. I pray it knowing that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. So you're stronger than any of my situations. Nothing can stop you from working when you set your mind to work. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would set your mind to work on our behalf and in our situations, we pray. Father, I ask it all in the name of Jesus to whom be all the glory, the honor, and the power forever and ever. Amen. And amen. Would you please stand with me this morning? Here's how I want to close our time together. Friend, if you've got a need in your life, I can't tell you enough there's hope in Jesus Christ. If you've got a situation going on in your life that you need help, healing, freedom, deliverance, whatever, my friend, you may need. Maybe you're here and you say, you know, I need Jesus Christ. And you say, you say, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what my past is like. Friend, I may not know your past, but in Jesus Christ, I know you can have a new future in him. Nothing can keep him from giving you a new future. And so today, friend, if you've come and you've got a need in your life, maybe it's salvation. Maybe it's healing. Maybe you're in a situation you say, I need God's strength to make it through this valley. I need God's healing of a broken heart and shattered dreams. Whatever your need may be, my friend, I want to tell you, He is the Lord over everything. Over everything. And so what I'd like to do, I'd love for us to have the opportunity to pray with you today. If you've come with a need in your life, Paula in just a few moments is going to lead us in some worship. And when she does, I'd like to invite you, if you've got a need today, to join. You know, in the first verse, we have people that stepped out and, and received prayer today, and I believe they went home with home singing a different song and I believe he can do the same thing for you in this second service today and so if you've got a need in your life and you'd like prayer you'd like somebody to agree together in prayer when she begins to sing I'd like to ask you to step out from where you're at and make your way across the front and when you do men and women are going to come we're going to join with you and we're going to pray with you and we're going to believe that the God of all hope will fill your heart and begin to work in your life so this morning, if you'd like prayer, would you come as she begins to sing this morning? Lord, Thank you, Jesus. Give you my heart. Lord, we give it all to you today. I give you my soul. We give it all to you today. If you'd like prayer, just step out, friend. I live Join these for others. You alone. Every breath that I take and every moment I'm away. Come and friend, if you like prayer, just keep coming.
said you're in control and we can trust you and we give you our all today Jesus there is no one like you Lord Jesus Lord help us to be faithful oh God to pray to stay in your word to witness to others to stay away from sin and run towards you God help us Lord God to follow you in faithfulness Lord as your disciples we give you all glory and all praise today everyone said the altars remain open. You are still welcome to come and spend some time in prayer or to have someone pray with you. We encourage you to stay strong in prayer. We encourage you to be people of the word, to read the Bible every day. We encourage you so much to find someone and tell them about Jesus. Ask God to bring people to you, to witness to them. We cannot encourage you enough. Shun sin and cling to the cross of Christ this week. Make Jesus first. Amen. We love you. God bless you today. God bless you.